Hi, my name is Morgan Brunel. I'm in the 2012 class, Marine Conservation and Policy. I did my capstone project on hands-on marine science learning. There are three parts to it, or three curricula. The first one is the intertidal zone, designed for elementary school students. The second one is the marine food web, also designed for elementary school students. And the third one is designed for high schoolers, and it deals with the primary producers of the ocean marine plants, corals, seagrass, and phytoplankton. I'll be describing those in more depth later. Thank you. This prop is for the Tides Lecture, designed for elementary school students. It's a cross-section of a temperate region's intertidal zone, this styrofoam thing right here. And in back, this poster shows each of the six zones and the animals that live in them. In the low tide zone, the zone closest to the ocean, which is submerged 100% of the time with seawater, contains urchins, sea stars, sea snails, and sea cucumbers. The next zone is the mid-tide zone. This zone is submerged 75% of the time with seawater. Hard clams and mussels are found here. The next zone is the high-tide zone. This zone is submerged 50% of the time and open to the air 50% of the time, and limpets live there. The next zone, which is never submerged but only gets wet during high tide, is the splash zone. This contains the rack, which is dead and decaying organic matter. The next zone is part of the marsh ecosystem. It's called the low marsh zone. Cord grass lives there. And the zone beyond that is called the high marsh zone. And sea lavender is found there. This is the species legend students use to identify the animals that are found in the traveling marine touch tank. This is the Stony Brook Flax Palm Marine Lab where the touch tank animals live throughout the summer. On the left, here's a top-down view of the flow-through sea table that they lived in. On the right, there's a sea star and the green crab, along with some urchins in the back. There's hydrozoans and a crab, urchins, another hermit crab, sea star, mussels, clam, and urchin. This is the digital version of the marine food web pyramid. The only exception here is that we have humans at the top of the pyramid and then the apex predators, tertiary consumers, secondary consumers, primary consumers, and primary producers. On the right, we note that energy is lost going up the food web through respiration. Okay. This prop is used for the Marine Food Web's lecture, designed for elementary school students. And as you can see, it's a marine food web pyramid, starting from the very top, or the apex predators, all the way down to the bottom, which is the primary producers. And this is a great prop for elementary school students students because it's hands-on. So you take off each organism and you have the students identify each organism, sea star, and then you, the purpose is to stick the correct organism onto the correct spot in the pyramid. So you figure out what sea stars eat and you figure out, oh, well, sea stars eat urchins. So you stick it here and so on. Tiger sharks, apex predators, and so on and so forth. Marine Plants and Phytoplankton for High School Marine Conservation, August 2012 by Morgan Brunel. A short review of plants. Plants are photosynthetic, meaning they take carbon dioxide and water and make glucose and oxygen. They're eukaryotic, meaning they have a nucleus and they contain chlorophyll A and B. Marine plants. They have some adaptations for living submerged in water. They have a thick cuticle, an open stomata for gas exchange, less rigidity than land plants, flat leaves, a less complex root system to a shallow extent. Three major categories of marine plants include seagrasses, mangroves, and corals. Seagrasses grow in temperate estuarine environments. Eelgrass, Zoster marina is the most common seagrass species on Long Island estuaries. Eelgrass has long, thin, green, ribbon-like leaves that lack cellulose support and are held up by the water column. They live in the euphotic zone. The euphotic zone is the depth to which 1% of sunlight penetrates the water surface. This is very important for marine plants since they are photoautotrophs. Light penetrates through the water column and below the zone there is negligible photosynthesis. Seagrass Ecology. Seagrasses are flowering plants that typically form beds. The beds can contain a single species or up to 13 different species living together. They must live within the photic layer in the euphotic zone. 
since they survive using photosynthesis. Seagrass commonly have algal epiphytes, which are other plants gro growing on their leaves. Seagrass ecosystem. Seagrasses are important because they stabilize the sediment, they improve water quality with increased sedimentation, they provide a nursery ground for juvenile fish, they oxygenate the water, and they provide food for other marine organisms. Threats to seagrasses, there are natural disturbances like grazing storms and desiccation, and then there are human disturbances which we can prevent, including eutrophication or too much phytoplankton in an ecosystem, which we'll talk more about later, habitat loss from boats, overfishing, or the loss of top predators, therefore the extreme epiphytic growth and the lack of sunlight. Next is mangroves. Mangroves live life on the edge. With one foot in the land and one in the sea, these botanical amphibians occupy a zone of desiccating heat, choking mud, and salt levels that would kill an ordinary plant within hours. Yet the forest mangroves form are among the most productive and biologically complex ecosystems on Earth. Mangroves grow in tropical and subtropical tidal areas from the latitudes 25 degrees north and 25 degrees south. They grow in fine sediments with low wave actions, and they can tolerate extreme salinity changes from brackish waters to up to 90 parts per thousand salinity. Tolerance for low oxygen conditions and tidal inundation are also present. They form coastal zonations. The red mangrove grows in the low tide zone, the black mangrove grows in the mean tide zone, and the white mangrove grows at the high tide zone. The red mangrove has viviparous seeds called propagules that become fully matured before dropping off the parent tree. They also have prop roots that suspend out of the water, giving the plant extra support and protection. These prop roots combat hypoxia by allowing a direct intake of oxygen through the root structure, like snorkels. The black mangrove is also viviparous, and they have germinated seedlings encased in a fruit. They do not have prop roots, but instead have nematophores that allow the roots to breathe while they are submerged. They also expel excess absorbed salt. The white mangroves have nematophores that are a little smaller, the roots anchor the plant in the soft sediment, and they grow best in areas where there are both fresh and salt water. The fruit contains large embryos. Threats to mangroves include shrimp farms and aquaculture, agriculture, pollution, marine waste and debris, land reclamations and deforestation, overharvesting of marine resources, and oil spills. Coral reefs. The coral itself is an animal, a polyp surrounded by a hard calcium carbonate shell. Zooxanthellae, the symbiotic photosynthetic marine algae, live within the tissues of the polyps. These algae nourish the coral and help them grow faster in clear waters. Without the zooxanthellae, corals would be unable to build their impre impressive reef structures. More about the zooxanthellae, they're unicellular algae, and they benefit from living within the coral polyp because they have a steady supply of carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. The corals also provide shelter. Two main types of multicellular algae on coral reefs are coralline algae and calcareous algae. The threats to coral reefs include ocean warming and coral bleaching, ocean acidification, water pollution, sedimentation, coastal development, destructive fishing practices, and careless tourism. Phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are the foundation of the food web. They generate oxygen, support fisheries, sink carbon, and they are identified by their size class. Chlorophyll A is called the universal pigment because all plants and phytoplankton contain at least chlorophyll A and often other accessory pigments too. Chlorophyll A is also used as a proxy for total phytoplankton biomass. Phytoplankton are evolutionarily old. They're the oldest organism on the planet, and they dominate oligotrophic organisms, places in the ocean where there are low nutrient concentrations. Phytoplankton are responsible for 50% of the oxygen you breathe. Diatoms are the most common class of phytoplankton. Eutrophication is a major problem when there are too many groups of phytoplankton in an area. 
artificial addition of nutrients to an ecosystem causes a bloom in biomass, commonly nitrogen and phosphorus runoff from fertilizers. Negative consequences also affect seagrass, like we just discussed. Some threats to phytoplankton include eutrophication, chlorofluorocarbons, mercury in the marine environment, global warming, phytoplankton biomass and population decline, 